You're listening to Conversations on Careers and Professional Life. I'm your host, Gregory Heller, from the MBA Career Management Office at the Foster School of Business at the University of Washington. This season, I'll be joined by co-host Jonathan Azoff, the co-founder and general partner of Snowcap, a venture capital firm investing in deep tech climate solutions in our global supply chains, for a series we're calling Conversations on Careers in Climate Tech. Welcome, Jonathan. Thanks, Gregory. Over the course of the season, we'll talk to entrepreneurs across climate tech and sustainability about their careers and the career opportunities for job seekers looking to impact one of the greatest challenges facing humanity. We'll break each conversation into two episodes, the first focusing on our guest's business, how it came to be, who their customers are, and what kind of impact they hope to have. And the second will focus on the advice our guest has for job seekers looking to make a pivot into this space. This season is made possible with funding from Snowcap. You can learn more about their fund and portfolio of investments at snocap.vc. This is part two of our conversation with Stephen Zhang, the founder of Climate Tech List. Stephen shares useful frameworks to help job seekers identify where they fit within the climate tech sector, emphasizing the importance of a systematic approach to the job search process. Additionally, he offers insights into how individuals can contribute to climate initiatives, even outside of direct roles in climate tech companies. If you're curious about carving a path in the climate tech sector or seeking ways to align your career with environmental impact, this discussion offers practical advice and perspectives. I hope you'll enjoy this second part of our conversation on careers in climate tech with Stephen Zhang. I think this is a good place to sort of shift into another line of questioning that Jonathan and I had thought about. I'd love to hear based upon your experience, what you've seen, sort of placing yourself at an intersection of uh, climate tech companies and job seekers, what insights you might have for job seekers. I know you mentioned the Bits First Atoms framework. Maybe you could talk about that as uh, sort of an insight for the the climate tech job seeker. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm going to give a little distillation of one of the talks I gave, which you can find on climatetechlist.com slash blog, the YouTube talk um, kind of talks about this in depth. I would say, you know, there's advice for like general job seekers and there's advice for like climate tech jobs. I'll just focus on the climate tech jobs for now. Thinking about what type of company, I, I guess there's like two broad frameworks that I, I can think of that for how to think about the effect of the company on climate change. So that's why people want to work on climate tech, right? So you, you want to affect climate change. One is this bits versus atom framework, which is a little bit less granular. Basically, like, do you want a company that moving bits, that's a software company, bits coordinating atoms, which is like, you know, software that move hardware at the end of the day. So Airtable would be like software company, uh, bits, on, bits only. Uh, and then the last one would be like a hardware, primarily a hardware company. So that's, we just call that atoms. Um, Thinking about where your skill set is and like what kind of company you want to work on. That's the uh, that's the like the Fred Wilson. Um, yeah, exactly. Framework, right? The, yeah, yeah, that came from I, Fred Wilson. And then uh, this was this bits versus atoms with this additional axis was like a collaboration among a couple of folks through uh, MCJ Collective that we released like a couple of years ago. And then the other axis, so it's like a three by three, essentially, is like, do you want to be working on reduction of carbon, like the flow of carbon, right? Like less emissions, the drawdown of carbon in general, like, so that would be like carbon removal, stuff like that, or um, adaptation. And I think that one in particular, I've talked to like, you know, at this point, I've talked to like dozens of people like live and like hundreds of people just chatting on LinkedIn when they use climate tech list. And that is something that's come up probably the most, which is, hey, I actually don't necessarily believe in this theory of change. You know, like maybe the most extreme would be like, I don't really buy carbon removal, which is a, you know, that's an opinion. That's, it's not, you know, the majority, but a lot of people have that opinion. I think having the option of being able to fil filter that out in the job board was something that I, uh, that was a feature I made. Um, but anyways, I think, just thinking about that kind of framework ahead of time is, yeah. is one suggestion I have. 
I, I think the stocks versus flows uh, metaphors are really valuable too. Often in our fund, we, we talk about like climate as a systemic problem yeah. and it needs systemic solutions. And so systems thinking, you know, if you study systems, like as an actual like science, like you went to school to study systems, complex systems, stocks and flows are like, you know, systems 101. Yeah. And so I think it's a really valuable way to like look and frame the problem because you understand where you fit in the system and you don't think about your impact from an inputs and outputs perspective. You think about it from an overall system change perspective. I think that's like a really important and valuable insight and uh, quite frankly relevant to your statement earlier that climate tech is not one thing right yep. it's not like one sector we, we I, i've written about this too i think a point in time term i think it's something that we you know use to describe all of these climate conscious professions and industries or i should say technologies within industries but ideally and hopefully it actually goes away in the future and all tech right. becomes climate tech right it some degree. yeah it's like we used to talk um, about tech companies right and now it's like every company is a tech company we talk about sustainability companies now but every company is becoming a sustainability yeah. company and, and i think that you know our future kind of depends on a move in the direction of most companies really focusing on how do they reduce their carbon footprint? How do they operate more efficiently? How do they enable other companies to do that as well? Yeah, exactly. And I would add to that is a way f like to add the job seeker lens to this is the bits versus atoms framework is, is kind of a skills based way of looking at jobs, right? You're like, you know, my skills is probably more in software or hardware. That's one way to like match the job. The other way to match it is, uh, and this is another framework to think about types of climate tech companies is like just using like drawdowns, list of solutions. So that's more like domain, right? Like I want to focus on food and ag. I want to focus on soil, se carbon sequestration. And I think the, the how you map that to jobs is that's like a base knowledge or domain expertise method of mapping and depending on the role too like one would be more important like if you're a product manager it probably matters more that you have the domain expertise versus like a software engineer um is it's less less relevant although it's still somewhat relevant right so i would say those are two frameworks to think about jobs and you're referring Climate to, tech jobs. to project drawdown which is a tremendous drawdown, tremendous yes. resource and i know that in your blog post i think you all should also referred to uh, speed and scale the john doors book which also sort of goes through a series of categories of climate tech solutions or climate solutions, I should say. So those are some entry points for the job seeker to really start to think about what it is that they would want to do, what kind of company they would want to point their efforts at, and then thinking about what skills do I have, or if someone's already in the workforce, what is my trade essentially am i a developer am i a marketer am i a salesperson and maybe thinking about how do you apply the skills of your trade to one of these particular categories of companies yeah exactly yeah can i, I, I want to double click on that for a second because like one thing that can get lost here is um, as you're thinking about skill application to technologies it implies a decision that was made before that, which is the decision to start a company by which they would then post jobs, raise money, post jobs that you would then apply to, right? There's a series of preconditions that must exist before you as a job seeker can even find these jobs. And I do think there's like an interesting decision matrix that sometimes occurs upstream of that. Like when I talk to people um, where they're like trying to figure out how to break into climate, and their natural instinct is to go to a climate tech list to look at what is available and out there. And, and in some sense, what they see is what, you know, has been offered as opposed to maybe the like broad swath of problem areas. So I feel like the drawdown thing is like an interesting way of like framing as well, because maybe you want to be a founder and maybe there isn't a solution 
out there already that has raised enough money to even be hiring jobs, right? Like there's almost like, I'm kind of dating myself a little bit, like there, there used to be this like founder dating thing, you know, where it was like, you would go meet someone who's a similar- They still have that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, that's great. I mean, I think it's an important function as well, right? Not, not everyone is fit. I can speak for myself. I'm basically unhirable at this point. Like it is sometimes hard if you have an idea to go start, you know, to, to go do something somewhere else. Sometimes you just want to go build it yourself. And so, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know if that's a good framing, but I do like that you split the two up because one framework will give you a broader perspective of problems, whereas the other is like, these are the solutions that are basically hiring at this point. Yeah, that's a great point on uh, like demand versus supply. You got to create the supply, right, of jobs. That's, that's why we're all on this mission to decarbonize. Um, the nice thing about, Project Drawdowns framework too, and I think Speed and Scale does this too. Is they actually have like a range of like GHG emissions that's associated with each problem, and so you can like kind of look at the rank and kind of get an eye. Of course, no single company is going to like offtake all of that. Yeah, that, that, that's one of the nice things. And I would say just on the like founder matching thing, I know like very early on during COVID, a lot of these Slack communities. I was most in MCJ, so I know about that the most a lot of people found their co-founders through that. And it's we still have this kind of magical moment, I think, in climate tech where it's a very um, positive, like mutual support community. Um, so even if someone doesn't want to be your co-founder, like they're still willing to help. And it's I don't see that that much in like other more established communities. It's partly because it's mission focused and partly because it's growing, I think. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I was going to go there obviously my climate journey as a community, the work on climate community is another one. And we're all sort of on team human to borrow a, a phrase from Douglas Rushkoff in a different, in a different context. We're all on the same team here, which is to reduce the amount of carbon in the atmosphere and ensure that the climate remains livable for humans uh, for many generations into the future. So while there's competition, it's kind of coopetition, as we used to say in the open source software realm that yeah, I started I my term. career nice. in. Um, so we, we've talked a lot about people who maybe have a particular skill set, a particular experience, and then how they can apply that to this really just tremendous problem set. A lot of listeners on my podcast by dint of the fact that I work at the Foster School of Business, are looking to pivot. They might have been a software engineer, now they want to be a product manager. Or they might have been a school teacher, and now they want to be a consultant. Do you have advice from the communities that you've been in and where you sit for the job seeker who's really looking to pivot, not only a pivot into climate tech, but also a pivot in job function? Great question. I think the the high level advice I would have is around, uh, so, so a couple of things. Uh, one is just being extremely thorough with following kind of the tree of opportunities, right? Like you talk to someone and then they recommend talking to two people, like make sure you follow up with those two people because you never know where these things go. And I, I think the one of the biggest mistakes job seekers make, and of course it depends on everyone's bandwidth and you know personal life situation, is just not being thorough about doing those follow ups, right? Like talk to the people that were recommended. A lot of people I have a couple other like job related websites out there will just and I, I think they're not being like malicious or anything. It's just like they're like, Hey, do you do you have any jobs in this thing? You know, like, hey, have you Googled this or have you like looked on the website? Have you looked through every one of these 1000 companies, right? Like I'm, I'm sure, you know, like maybe you've looked at like a couple dozen, but there's so many different opportunities out there. Um, so I, I would say that's like the, the high level advice I have is just being really thorough. The second thing is there are kind of macroeconomic realities that are happening right now, which is one you know, you mentioned product manager. It is a kind of a hard time to find PM jobs in climate tech for a couple of reasons. One, there's a lot of really good PMs out there who got laid off in the last year, multiple times. Maybe climate tech companies are kind of in the stage where they may not need PMs yet, right? So it's kind of a nice to have. Yeah, this is like that's the kind of macro reality. So like changing expectations or 
adjusting expectations would be the other advice. Like if you really are trying your best and you're hitting a wall, like either pivot to a different role right now and then switch into climate tech or, you know, don't do the pivot in the role and just in the company. And I have some thoughts actually uh, on how to contribute to climate tech, even if you're not directly working at a climate tech company, if you want to talk about that later. Uh, yeah, I'd let, let's go right into that. Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on contributing to this space while not working in a climate tech company, because, you know, a lot of MBA students, they want to go work for a big name. They don't want to work for, you know, a company that's early stage and maybe isn't going to be around two or three years from now. They want to have a big name on their their resume right out of school for a variety of reasons. So what are your thoughts there? Yeah, um, I think this ties to our previous point about the ecosystem being really friendly. Like, OK, so when I was at Airtable, right, I was there for like basically four years, like the first year I did a bunch of volunteering during COVID with USDR, which is like a civic tech organization. And then in 2021, 2022, it was all just kind of on the side, helping a bunch of people on MCJ. And I actually think, you know, I added some value to some people and it probably resulted in some like net carbon reduction, <laughs> like down the line. Right. And, and I'm actually pretty like felt pretty rewarding. Right. To your be, scope, like, your scope. I can help impact. people. Sort of yeah, impact. Exactly. Yeah, 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 exactly. So I think there's a lot of opportunities like that for people. And especially when you have a full time job, you can kind of find the high impact opportunities that may not you can kind of decouple pay from it. Right. I had done a bunch of work actually when I was living in Seattle with a bunch of political advocacy organizations that were pushing various like incentive programs around like decarbonization. And, you know, th that's those are roles that like no one's really going to pay for. Maybe they have like one full time staffer. But because I have my full time job that was stable, I could like work on this as much as I want. And it was a really great, like personally rewarding experience, but also really good learning experience as well. So I would say those two things. And then finally, I would say just exploring the space. Now, most cities have like meetups, right? There's Seattle Climate Tech. There's a newsletter and like a pretty regular meetup. Boston has you know, a bunch of these cities have them. Go to those events and see kind of where the opportunities for just writing exist, right? I think I'm a big fan in the last year because I think all of us, I've met both of you from writing on LinkedIn. <laughs> um, it's just writing about different topics, like find a niche. Like if you're an MBA student and you're really focused or grad and you're, you really know a lot about um, a certain aspect of operations or like manufacturing supply chain, and you're working at like a non climate tech company that do that, like you can write about that as long as, you know, okay with your employer and whatever, but you can write about that in the context of like, let's say batteries or whatever. And that's a way one, you can contribute to like the ecosystem. And two, it will also build your own portfolio of work and you can be known as the person you know, who, who has expertise in this down the line if you want to go work at a company or start your own. Yeah, I love this advice. I think that uh, I want to underscore the importance of networking, I think, is coming up in what you're saying and being yeah. of service to your network. The other thing you mentioned is sort of the decoupling of money making from meaning making, which is a yeah. framework that's presented in the book, Designing Your Life. You know, you can do what you do for money. And then you can do what you do for meaning. And I know effective altruism has taken a hit in recent months uh, for a variety <laughs> of reasons. But I, I think at its core, that's sort of the idea of it. You know, if you're most marketable as an employee in a context that is not the climate tech context, you can go and do that. You can make your, your living that way. And you can then give additional time, energy, and perhaps money to the things that make meaning for you. And that might be in uh, climate change and climate tech. Yeah. And actually, yeah. specifically on that, like, you know, when you're at a company, you actually have a lever for change, which is your company, right? And I'm not talking about like, getting recycling bins installed in your company office, although that's important, but it's definitely not the highest leverage thing, like getting your company to like, do, you know, take pretty big action. I, I, so in 2018, I started getting involved politically at this, uh, there was like a statewide carbon fee ballot measure that's now passed, but it, it failed that particular ballot measure. And I remember looking at the donors and I was like, wow, the CTO of my company, Tableau, 
like is one of the biggest donors after Mike Bloomberg <laughs> and Bill Gates. So I was like, oh, wow, like this is pretty cool that, you know, Chris Stolte is doing this. So I started researching and like, how can I have an impact through my tech network? And I found these people who are Amazon employees and they were like, we're going to go do something bold at the shareholder meeting to like kind of help Amazon shift towards a more pro-climate stance and whatever. And I was like, wow, good luck with that, right? And they, they're not the only reason for it happening, but the whole Climate Pledge Fund and all those things were a big part of the reason was from this group of like, I don't know, a couple dozen people's work. That's amazing. I, yeah. I, I actually, like I talk to them all the time. I know some of the investors on that team and I had no idea that that was the provenance, you know, for, for the Climate uh, Pledge Fund. Very, that's Yeah, so it's super awesome. cool. I mean, it, this is 2018, right? So this is kind of before yeah. the, like, this boom yeah. pick up. So. Can, can I ask a question, Stephen, just yeah. about network, since we're on the topic of networking. Yeah. Earlier, you made a point about follow-up being really important. Now, you're a Tableau Airtable guy. I, I, I suspect that your personal CMS is pretty robust. I think you probably do a great job of remembering things using software, if I'm not mistaken. I'm just that. like, I'm just gonna throw it out there. I bet you do a better job than most at that. And so like, it, it can be easy to say like follow-up's important and you know, but like maybe this is like a future blog post for you or something. But I think like if creating value in your network to use Gregory's um, statement earlier is valuable and follow-up is a major part of that. Like, are there tips that you can provide for job seekers about like how to basically show up for their network and to, to not lose sight of that important principle? Yeah, um, I think this applies to, you know, like broadly to like networking and, and specifically to just like when you do your job search, right? I'm actually surprised by how many people do a job search and they don't have like a list or a table or a spreadsheet or Airtable based somewhere of kind of what companies are looking at. And like, you don't have to log it to like a super granular degree, but just having that logged. I think the general principle is like, this is a, you got to operationalize and systemize it. Uh, that's the only way you're going to be able to like do it scalably and sustainability it's sustainably. And it's, a you know, especially if you're in job, a job seeking mode, you like, that's your job, right? Like to find a job. So I think treating it like a job with like the amount of like intention, that's probably like the biggest advice I have. So I'm, I'm going to try and drill down just a little bit deeper. Yeah, sure. Most people are job searching maybe once every three or four years. Maybe they're getting an opportunistic yeah. knock on their door and they're moving in between that. So it's not like we all have the system in place all the time for doing this. So let's say you find yourself laid off or you find yourself, you're a student and you've got, you're steering down graduation and you know you have to do this. Uh, as someone who's like a data guy, right? How would you advise people to do that kind of tracking? Like, is there a tool uh, and I'm not saying, are you going to shill for Airtable or something here? But like, is there a tool? No, I'll or shill a for Airtable. I love the that, tool. <laughs> that you think that that a job seeker should use to create that? We used to call it like a tickler file or whatever, where you have like the company is that who from you uh, talk GTG. To. I don't even know. Probably the tickler. Okay, um, yeah, nice. But yeah, where where you have the the company name, the person you talked to, the last time you talked to them, you know what the follow up was supposed to be. You know, I know that there are some tools out there that have that are coming around that have been designed for the job seeker to manage the job search. I have not dug into enough of them deep enough to be able to endorse any one of them yet. But I'm wondering what your thoughts are on this. Yeah, I would just say like very simply having a table, right? Like every row is a company and you have some attributes and as it goes on, you're going to update those attributes. I have two articles uh, to recommend and uh, I guess we I'll send them to you to put in the show notes. I wrote this like kind of right after I got laid off in December 2022 or was it? Yeah, around that time period, I published this because I was like, well, I have some time. Let me just publish stuff I have in Google Docs. I never had the time to polish. And one of them was this interview guide from when I um, did my interviews in 2019, actually, when I was living in Seattle and actually went to, I think you guys are based in like 
founders hall or something. I had an interview there um, with the company there uh, of the many. But I, at that point, I, I had this crazy job search. I didn't realize how many offers I would get. And it was a different macroeconomic time, right? So I'm not saying I definitely wouldn't be as successful now, but I, I had like 25 on sites and got like, or 25 interviews and got like 18 offers. So I wrote this really in-depth articles and I have screenshots of the tables that I use to track. And again, it's not about the details. I think just when people see it, uh, the feedback I've gotten is, wow, I saw these tables and I like viscerally realized, okay, this is what it means to like operationalize it. I think that's, that's been helpful for people. Um, That'd be great. So, yeah, we'll I would say, you know, any spreadsheet tool, honestly. But we'll definitely put that in the show notes. I'll, I'll uh, uh, throw one one human note into all of this. Uh, I'm a deeply analytical person myself as well, and I've certainly used spreadsheets uh, in my job searches in the past. I've gone so far as to assign like point systems and things like that to offers uh, during you know uh, I guess times when I, I received several offers and and I needed to compare them. And I did, and I have to admit it to myself. I did something that I think is worth mentioning is at the end of the day, your bias is your bias and um, your bias will just be reflected in your points and you'll still end up picking a company to work at that you're most biased towards anyway. You'll just make the points work out in that way. At least that's what <laughs> yeah, happened, that's yeah, what yeah. happened to me. And yeah. so I just called, I, I just wanted to call that out. That's it's okay as well. Like to like to not be as analytical, but I do like, I think operationalizing it in whatever way makes sense for you is like a really good strategy. I think being over overly analytical too can can sometimes just be full circle and you'll just be right back to <laughs> to where you would have been anyway. That's a great point. You uh, gotta align the yeah. heart and the head, right? That's the yeah. ideal decision <laughs> is to be able to do that. Yeah. yeah. But I, I think you know, less on the decision deciding which company to join. I think just even getting to the like interview and offer stages, that's where I think the operationalizing is the most helpful. To make sure nothing slips through the cracks. Yeah. Or, or actually, here's another one that's very simple, and I don't see too many people do. Get a Calendly and just use that to book with recruiters, right? Instead of like emailing back and forth and stuff. And, and obviously make the Calendly available so it's not just like you have to wait till two weeks from now. Yeah, just doing that simple thing. All right. So as we come to the end of our time together, and I think this has been a great conversation to to get us kicked off with this mini series, I'd love to hear if there are any recommendations that you have beyond the My Climate Journey community and obviously the uh, Climate Tech List and and work on climate and some of the newsletters that are out there for different cities, uh, climate tech communities. Are there other recommendations that you would have for a job seeker books or podcasts or websites that you have come across that you think are valuable in the job search? Yeah. Um, so just to kind of summarize all the existing resources, I have this blog post, climatetechlist.com slash new to climate. That's, that's, that's kind of my distillation of all those things. You know, if you need a one pager, that is a good one for you. Some other frameworks that I've found helpful has been uh, Cal Newport. Uh, he wrote Deep Work and So Good They Can't Ignore You. And he has a podcast. Just Even if you just read the summaries of the book, because I think it really influenced me early on in my undergrad days about like, because actually my interest in climate goes all the way back to the early 2010s when I was in undergrad. And it was the clean tech 1.0 bubble. And I was at engineering school, but I kind of never narrowed down to one thing. And I realized like, after listening, reading Cal Newport, like the skill is also very important, right? Again, it's not a universal rule, but how do I be so good they can't ignore you right? in this? Uh, I'm not sure I'm there yet for anything, but like, you know, just being able to like add value with the skill set. Um, that's kind of why I focused on software engineering. Um, another one. I don't that know, I, 26 offers. That's uh, <laughs> 18, 18, not 26. I don't want any rumors 18. going oh, on. Okay, 18. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm really good at interviewing. That's, that's the thing. Um, and then the other one I found really helpful has been 80,000 hours, which is kind of adjacent to effective altruism, but I think they're a little broader. And uh, they have these in depth problem profiles. The one on climate's like quite good. It's a little outdated, but it's like there's not that many resources that kind of go down to that level of analytical thinking. And of course, like Jonathan said, it's jobs, you know, finding a job is it's left and right brain. But I think there's probably a lot of like, you know, uh, right brain stuff out there already. So I found 80,000 hours particularly helpful, especially if you're like 
right out of college or in college, they have these like in-depth profiles and like types of roles you can do like a policy, it was like congressional lobbyists. You don't make a lot of money at the beginning, but you have a lot of influence versus like there's like roles that are the opposite of that, right? Um, I, I wish I, I read that when I was in undergrad. Yeah, that's a great website. Well, Stephen, I want to thank you for having this conversation on careers and professional life with me and Jonathan. And to all the listeners, you'll be able to find links to the websites and articles that Stephen mentioned in the show notes at conversationsoncareers.com. Thanks for having me. So that was a great conversation with Stephen about how he built Climate Tech List and the advice that he has for job seekers. What stood out for you, Jonathan? Yeah, I, I mean, right off the bat, his recognition that climate tech is not just like one thing, I think is so smart. And it's so it's so relevant to job searchers who are so used to thinking about, you know, their skill applied to a, a given sector, but all basically within an industry like software or something like that. Like these are multiple industries and they all have different roles. They may even be the same set of skills, but just completely titled differently because they're in such different industries, right? And I, I think like that's that's really something um, that stood out to me. So, you know, some of the conversations that I've had with people are like, if you work in software, software's in every company. You might just have to get used to the idea that your product is not the thing making the money anymore. It's helping for sure, but it's it's a different part of you know the overall business. So I, I think like something there is is really helpful, and and the way he's kind of framing it, I think, can be can be useful to folks who are, are just dipping their feet in this world. Oh, what stood out to you? I think his message about the importance of follow through and networking is critically important for people. I tell my students all the time that networking is how you're going to learn about jobs is how you're going to learn about industries and businesses and that network is going to pay dividends for you long past the job search that you're in now and i think that steven's message about uh, showing up adding value where you can and following through on what you learn, what you hear, the recommendations that are given to you. I think all of that's really helpful for, for people to hear. And I think that Stephen has really demonstrated that in his career and through the conversation we had. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Thank you for listening to Conversations on Careers and Professional Life. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider sharing it with a friend or classmate. Help others find the show by leaving a rating or review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. Conversations on Careers and Professional Life is produced by me, Gregory Heller, with support from the Foster School of Business Office of MBA Career Management. Learn more about the show, find show notes, and past episodes, and get in touch with me at conversationsoncareers.com. This episode was produced with editing and engineering support from Amelia Nguyen, a student in the Communication Leadership Master's Program at the University of Washington, and made possible in part with funding from Snowcap, a venture capital firm investing in early stage platforms that directly and indirectly solve the climate crisis. Learn more at snowcap.vc. That's S-N-O-C-A-P dot V-C.